What can the living do to benefit the dead? The first three things that are explicitly mentioned. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. It is authentic. When the son of Adam dies, all of his deeds stop except for three. Number one, sadaqa jariya. Charity that is jariya. Jariya means running. Jariya means ongoing. In English, we call it perpetual charity. Any charity that is more than a one-off. You do it and it remains after you have done it. When you build a masjid, as long as people are coming to the masjid, the sadaqa jariya. You build an orphanage, this is sadaqa jariya. It's something that is lasting after you have initially done it. It's not a one-off. Its benefit continues, especially after you die, you're going to be benefiting after it when you are in the grave. Number two, knowledge that people benefit from. The smallest bit to the largest bit. You are dead and somebody benefited from your knowledge then you will be getting that ajr and your body is in the qabr. So whether you taught somebody how to pray, your children how to pray, and now they are praying and you are in the qabr, every time they pray, you will get their reward because you taught them. Giving da'wah is included in this category. Our Prophet Sallallahu said, Hadith is a Sahih Muslim, whoever calls people to a guidance, shall get the reward of all who follow him without diminishing either's reward. Neither will get lesser reward just because one followed the other. You have a Muslim colleague at work, not very religious, and you become friends, you invite them out bit by bit. Yeah, okay, let's pray Jum'ah together. And they become more religious, inshallah, because of your akhlaq and manners. Every single salah that this person does, Allah will bless you with that reward. And the one who prays will get 100% of his own reward as well. And therefore, when the person dies, the first person, the second person's reward will continue to go back. Another hadith that also proves this, whoever introduces into Islam a precedent that is good shall be rewarded with all those who follow that precedent until the day of judgment. And whoever introduces an evil shall be given the sin of all those who did that evil until the day of judgment. Category three, a righteous child making dua for him. The reason why piety is mentioned here is because the point is being given. The mother, the father invested the time, the effort, the tarbiyah. The mother, the father helped in this piety. That is a lifelong effort. Now that the parent has deceased and moved on, so now that effort will pay off. When we are in the qabr, we want all of these three things to be giving. Our investments need to pay off. This is the time to invest, dear Muslim men and women. Now, we can add to this one other thing that is mentioned in one hadith, number four, and that is ribat fi sabilillahi azza wa jal. The murabit is the one who technically is guarding the borders of the ummah. And it's a very difficult, a very lonely, very boring job, but also very dangerous. Far from civilization, far from family and home. It's not easy to do. And our Prophet ﷺ said that the one who does ribat and dies in that state, he shall be safe from the fitna of qabr and his deed will continue to be written for him until judgment day. Even if he dies a natural death at the post guarding the ummah, then that natural death will not stop the thawab coming in and he will continue to be rewarded until judgment day. Point number five, five A and B. Five A, dua, five B, istighfar. وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا Those who come after the Ansar and the Muhajirun, they say, رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ Oh Allah, forgive us and forgive our brethren who have come before us. Meaning the ones who have died. This ayah is explicit dua for the deceased. Allah is telling us, make dua for all the Muslims from before you up until the time of the Sahaba. And as well, we have so many evidences from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of them is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam going to Baqi' making dua for the deceased. Of them is praying for the deceased in the janazah itself. In fact, what is the Salatul Janazah? Except dua for the deceased. The dua doesn't need to be in Arabic. The Quran must be in Arabic. The dua can be in any language. Hadith in Abu Dawood, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when you pray for the deceased, pray with sincerity. Pray with ikhlas. Us. Why? Because you will need it when it's your turn. Hadith also in Abu Dawood. After they buried the person, the Prophet ﷺ said, Now is the time to make dua to Allah to make him firm. 
Now is the time to ask him for sabat, for afiyah, because now he is being asked by the angels. So we make dua for the deceased at any time and in particular at two occasions. Number one, in the janazah, salatul janazah. And number two, right after dafn. Abu Huraira narrated in the Muslim Imam Ahmad, it is mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise the ranks of a rajul salih in Jannah after his death, obviously. The man will say, Ya Rabb, where is this coming from? What have I done that I'm getting an upgrade now? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Your child is asking Allah's forgiveness for you. In reality, dua and istighfar are related as we know because istighfar is a category of dua. Dua for the deceased, you ask anything that is needed by the deceased. Make his qabr vast. Make his qabr, in another hadith, lightened. Make it one of the gardens of paradise. What else can we ask? Good companionship, give him good angels. And in particular, the most important dua is istighfar. And that is what, O oh Allah, forgive his sins. O oh Allah, cleanse him the way that a white cloth is cleansed. In another hadith, O oh Allah, substitute his sins with good deeds. Another hadith that mentions dua and istighfar, Abu Asyat mentions, we were sitting with the Prophet wasallam when one of the Banu Salama tribe arrived. And he said that, O oh Messenger of Allah, is there anything I can do for my parents now that they have died? The Prophet said, Yes. And he mentioned five things. Number one, making dua for them. Number two, istighfar for them. Number three, fulfilling the oaths and covenants that they had after them. If they have a wasiyah, if they have a treaty, if they have anything that they told you to do, now that they're gone, you have to continue doing this. And number four, visiting the relatives that you would not have done except with them. We all have people that are our relatives that we don't have a relationship with them, but our parents did. When the parents move on, the relatives are still there to visit those relatives that the parents kept in touch with for the sake of the parents. One of my teachers remarked at this, why? What's gonna happen if you visit some person 50, 40 years older than you, you have nothing in common, there's no conversations you had with them, right? Now you go visit, what's the benefit? What will be the only topic of conversation? The deceased, because that's the one thing in common, correct, right? And what will happen when the deceased is mentioned over and over and over again? Istighfar, dua, what's gonna happen psychologically? The heart is gonna feel comfort and softness as well. Well, the love will be renewed. And then number five, to be generous with their friends. What should a good loving son or daughter do once the parents have moved on or either of the parents have moved on? The Prophet ﷺ gave five things. Number one, you make dua for them. Number two, istighfar. Number three, whatever promise or amana or something, you have to follow that. Number four and five is essentially their circle of friends and relatives. You keep it up. Now we move on to gifting our own good deed. Number six now, sadaqa on behalf of the deceased. Aisha narrates, a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, my mother passed away suddenly. And I feel if she had lived, she would have given some charity. Will she get the ajr if I give sadaqa on her behalf? And the Prophet said, yes. And the hadith is Sahih Bukhari. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, his mother was an Ansariya lady. She embraced Islam and she died in the lifetime of the Prophet So Sa'ad came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, my mother passed away. And I wasn't here when she passed away. I was on a journey. If I give sadaqa on her behalf, will it benefit her? So the Prophet ﷺ said, yes. So Sa'ad said, I ask you to bear witness that I give my garden, al-mikhraf, as a charity in her name. Two birds with one stone. Sadaqa jariya for the deceased. And the Prophet ﷺ explicitly allowed it. It appears Sa'ad loved his mother so much, he wasn't even satisfied with this. Because we have another hadith in Sunan Abi Dawud that Sa'ad ibn Ubadah came back to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, what is the best sadaqa that I can give for my mother? So the Prophet ﷺ said, Said, a well of water. Sa'ad paid some money to dig a well and he said, this is the well for Umm Sa'ad. Number seven, Hajj and Umrah. Ibn Abbas said, hadith is in Bukhari, that a woman from the tribe of Juhayna came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, my mother made a vow to Allah that she would perform Hajj and she passed away without fulfilling the nadhar. May I do Hajj on her behalf? The Prophet ﷺ said, let me ask you, if your mother left a 
would you not repay that debt? She said, yes. So he said, the debt of Allah has more right that you fulfill it back. Do a hajj on behalf of your mother. And the Prophet was saying, this is a debt owed to Allah. Okay, what if you fulfill the debt? Now you just want to pay extra. That's not explicit, but there's one narration that is used. And this is the famous one in Abu Dawood that when the Prophet was going for hajj, the Prophet was wearing the ihram and a man wore the ihram and said, Labbayka an shubruma. Labbayk on behalf of shubruma. The Prophet said, Who is Shubruma? The man said, He is a friend or a brother. The Prophet asked this man, Did you do Hajj on behalf of yourself first? He said, No. So now the Prophet said, Hujja an nafsik, thumma hujja an Shubruma. Do Hajj on your own behalf and then go ahead and do Hajj on Shubruma. Category 9 fasting. Aisha narrated that the Prophet said, Whoever dies and he had some fast that he had to still do, then his Wali should fast on his behalf. And Amr ibn al-As said, Ya Rasulullah, my father al-As ibn Wa'il, before he died, he made another to Allah to sacrifice 100 camels. And my brother Hisham took half of that nadr and the other half is on me. Do I have to do the other 50? Interestingly enough, Hisham and Amr both accepted Islam and the father refused to the end and he did not accept Islam. And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if only your father had accepted Tawheed, then if you had had fasted and given charity on his behalf, he would have benefited from that. Meaning what? There's no point. Because he didn't die as a Muslim. Now this hadith is quite explicit. Siyam is mentioned here. وَتَصَدَّقْتَ And this is not obligatory per se. It's just he said, I want to give a hundred camels. It would have benefited him. Now let's look at how our scholars of fiqh understood these ahadith. There is a spectrum of opinion when it comes to gifting the good deeds to the deceased and our madhahib. The Hanafi madhab from its beginning has said that any and all good deeds can be gifted to the deceased without any restrictions. In fact, most of them even said, why stop at disease, give them to the living as well. Al-Kasani writes, it doesn't matter whether the one you gift a deed to is alive or dead, you may gift. And it doesn't matter whether you intend to gift before you do the deed, or you make up your mind after the deed has been done, and you decide after it's been done, I'm going to give this deed to the dead. And the Hanafi madhab allows the gifting of any good deed, including salah. And of course, siyam and hajj, and Umrah and Qiraat al-Quran, anything and everything can be gifted to anyone else. What did Imam Malik and Imam Shafi'i say? Imam Shafi'i said, other than fulfilling the wajib, such as the guy didn't fast or whatnot, and sadaqah and dua and istighfar, four things. No deed benefits the dead and nothing reaches the dead. Imam Malik himself was on the same madhab as Shafi'i, no gifting. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal was of the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal allowed good deeds to be gifted to the deceased without any restrictions whatsoever. Ibn Qudama is the medieval icon of Hanbalism and he writes, any good deed that a person does and gives its thawab to a Muslim mayyit, Allah Azza wa Jal will benefit the mayyit because of it. Some ulama said that when you read Quran for the deceased, what the deceased gets is the barakah and the sakina and not the reward. Ibn Qudama says no, that's not the case. Rather, the deceased gets the thawab and then he says, and this is ijma' al-Muslimin. The unanimous actions of the Muslims in every era and in every land, they come together and they recite Quran and they give the thawab to their dead without anybody criticizing them. Now, what do you think Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam said? And he's from the Hanbali school. Ibn Taymiyyah and his student Ibn al-Qayyim, they are very, very explicit that all good deeds can be gifted to the deceased. Ibn Taymiyyah writes, it is confirmed that the Prophet Sallallahu allowed giving charity for the deceased and he allowed fasting for the deceased. And these evidences and others are used by Imam Ahmad and Abu Hanifa to allow gifting other deeds like the Salah and the Qira'at al-Quran to the deceased. However, Ibn Taymiyyah says, 
you should be known that it is not from the regular customs of the Sahaba and Tabi'un that every time they prayed or every time they read Quran or fast or did Hajj that they would gift their deeds to the deceased or even to their relatives and indeed the best method is to follow what the Salaf did. And Ibn Al-Qayyim basically says that out of all of these texts adding to one another, we can prove that the rewards of the good deeds reach the dead when a living person does it for him. And even common sense and qiyas, i.e. rationality proves this point. Why? Because he said, the reward of the good deed, who owns it? The one who has done it. So the one who has done it has the right to gift it to whomever he chooses. Just like in this dunya, if I have some money, don't I have the right to gift it to anybody? Then he mentions explicitly, as for reciting the Quran and gifting it to the deceased without paying, this will reach the dead just like fasting and hajj reaches the dead as well. And I have no problem. You want to say that reciting the Quran is not allowed? This is what Imam Shafi'i said. But don't make the other group mubtadir. Have your position, defend it, and then tolerate a position that goes back to the tabi'un taba tabi'un. That was and still remains a majority of the ummah to this day. I have to say this is the mistake. The mistake is not in the position you want to hold. The mistake is in not allowing another position to have a legitimacy to it. Because this is where we get fractions, fighting, infighting. We have enough problems outside the ummah to be worried about fighting over these issues inside the ummah. Live and let live when it comes to these internal issues. And to finish off, we've talked about the issue of gifting, but do realize when you gift your good deeds to the deceased, what you are doing is saying to Allah, Oh Allah, I don't want this good deed anymore. Give it to somebody else. Do you go around giving all of your money to somebody else? No matter how much you love somebody, they'll take some of your money, but you keep some for yourself. And the more you love them, the more you give, but you also have rent to pay. You also have yourself to take care of. When you gift a good deed, you are saying, if this is the deed, oh Allah, I don't want it. Give it to my mother. Now, no doubt, you should gift to your mother, your father, your deceased. Go ahead, whoever needs to be given, but you also need a healthy dosage for yourself on Qiyam. Also, you hope that Allah will give you for your generosity. 